and not step on their toes by talking about a confrontation between science and religion. Ed Wilson, another dear friend, uh, wants to enlist the mainline religious denominations as allies in the defense of the environment. I, I respect their views, uh, and, I, and I understand their motives, and uh, I don't condemn them, but I'm not having it. To me, the conflict for, between science and religion is more important than these issues of science education or even environmentalism. I think um, the world needs to wake up from its long nightmare of religious belief. And uh, anything that we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion uh, should be done and may, in fact, in the end, be our greatest contribution to civilization. Thank you. Whose reality do we appeal to for truth? This is the common fallacy of confusing the map for the place. It equates individual perceptions of reality with reality. Whose map of Earth is accurate? Different maps are going to be accurate to different degrees. It's the Earth that is the arbiter of what is correct. There is only reality. The internal maps of reality are secondary. Our goal, by the way, is to construct the most accurate map of reality, as I said during size opening. And it's no solution to assert that you're certain that your map is right. Asserting that God exists and we all know it is not a solution to this problem. It's not a defense of God, it's not an argument, and it's not relevant to this debate or any debate. In order to be reasonable to believe that God exists, we'd need a valid and sound argument supported by evidence, just as we would for any other proposition. It's unreasonable to begin by presupposing the proposition in question. It is unreasonable to believe something merely because it has not been proven wrong. And it's boneheadedly silly to claim that you can't possibly be proved wrong and pretend that that settles the argument. And as to whether or not we can know anything, the only demonstration that I can give is that I wrote this rebuttal ahead of time. <laughs> All the churches that Sarah Palin has attended, and she's been to almost as many churches as she has colleges, have one thing in common, a belief that the Bible is literally true. She's not country first, she's Bible first. And not just the New Testament. That's the happy half of the good book. The baby in the manger and Jesus doing magic tricks. Long romantic walks on the water that turn into fishing trips with the guys. And a generally positive message. Jesus, after all, preached love and forgiveness, not shooting wolves from an airplane. The problem is Governor Avon lady She takes the Old Testament literally, too, and in that one, God is an insecure, rage-filled hybrid of Bobby Knight and Suge Knight. <laughs> He's been alive forever, and he has anger issues. He's like John McCain if McCain could fart hail. <laughs> He's pro-slavery, pro-polygamy, and homophobic, and he'll kill you for masturbating. More people get stoned in the Old Testament than in my jacuzzi. <laughs> <laughs> if there was a video of Barack Obama standing in front of his congregation being healed by a black witch doctor, this election would be over. But there is that video of Sarah Palin. In the name of Jesus, every form of witchcraft is what you are rebuke in the name of Jesus. So ask your witch doctor if exorcism is right for you. <laughs> witch doctor because he's black. I say it because when you're rebuking witches, you're a witch doctor. <laughs> witch doctor, folks, this is our country. We got to get it back from the forces of organized superstition. People like Bush and Palin simply cannot think clearly because they're in a big, scary brainwashing cult, and it warps their thinking so much that they're actually horny for the end of the world. And it, that is not someone I want with the nuclear codes. So remember that video. And remember that Sarah Palin said, and I quote, I think I will see Jesus come back to earth in my lifetime. To which I say, hasn't Jesus suffered enough?
What's to prevent you from going out and committing murder if you don't believe in God? Uh, what do you say to people who insist that there can never be any morality without religion? Uh, well, yeah, as you say, this is an incredibly common question, and we're all wise to prepare an answer for it. I happen to have one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what one counterpoint to this, this suspicion is, if you just, just look at, at the societies where there is the least homicide, the least violent crime, these really are the, the most atheistic societies on the planet. I mean, if you, if you just look at the, the UN Development Index, that, which ranks societies by violent crime, by literacy, by, by uh, educational attainment, by per capita income, uh, without exception, apart from the, the presence of the United States somewhere in the t top 20, these are the most atheistic societies on the planet. Societies like the Netherlands and, and Canada and Australia, Sweden. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever that high levels of religious adherence leads to a moral society. In fact, if you look at our, within our own culture, if you look at you know, the red state, blue state divide, where, where are most of the murders occurring? Where are most of the, the teen pregnancies even? And even the abortions, the, these are happening in, our, in, the, in those states that have the highest level of religious adherence. I'm actually not a fan, and I've received some heat for this, I'm not a fan of words like secularism and atheism. I, I don't think we have to name the, the counterpoint to religious irrationality. We don't have words to, des to describe not being an astrologer or not being an alchemist. I mean, I mean, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm not an astrologer, I'm not an astrologer. <laughs> and and to, to some degree, I think the same will work for not being duped by the false certainties of religion. It, it, it's, we simply need to apply reason. We can talk about being rational. I don't think we have, ultimately, I don't think we have to talk about being secular. I'm not actually recommending that we just oppose every claim to religious conviction wherever we find it. I'm not, I'm not recommending that, you know, in a closed elevator, you hear someone talk about Jesus and you, you unleash on them. Uh, it's, really, it's really just in situations like this, as a start, I think, you know, when you're at the podium or when you're writing an editorial for the, or, or an opinion piece for the newspaper, or you're in, you're in a, a situation where you are advancing the conversation of, about ideas, um, it seems to me that we all have a, a moral responsibility to be deeply honest about these things. I think we've all of us been accused of uh, going after the easy targets of the Jerry yeah. Falwells of this world and ignoring the sophisticated yeah. Uh, professors yes. of theology and I mean I don't know what you feel about that but one of the things I feel is that the sophisticated professors of theology will say one thing to each other and to in intellectuals generally but will say something totally different to a congregation they'll, they'll talk about miracles they'll talk about well they won't um, talk to a congregation <laughs> well oh, and, and, and archbishops in fact, will that, yes that, but, but when the sophisticated theologians try to talk to the preachers the preachers won't have any of it well that's that's yeah, true i course. mean yeah. The, the, yeah. you got to realize that sophisticated theology is like stamp collecting it's a very specialized thing and mm -hmm. only a few people do it and, and a negligible they take influence in, they take in, the in their own laundry and uh and uh they uh get all excited about some very arcane details and their own tr religions pay almost no attention to what they're saying. Uh, a little bit of it does, of course, filter in, but it always gets beefed up again for general consumption uh, because what they say in their writings, at least from my experience, is uh, eye-glazing, mind-twisting, uh, very subtle things which have no particular bearing on life. But the other thing is that, never mind about the, the academic theologians, bishops and, and vicars, who will attack us for taking uh, scriptures, or, or for accusing people of taking scriptures literally. And of course, yeah. of course we don't believe the book of Genesis literally. And yet, they do preach about what Adam and Eve did, as though they, were, as though they did exist, as though they're somehow it's a sort of license to no, talk about no. things which 
they know, and anybody of any sophistication mm. knows, is fiction. And yet they will treat their congregations, their sheep, um, as though they did exist, as though they were factual. And a, a huge number of those congregations actually think they did exist. Maybe the deepest area of conflict between science and religion, although I don't think it gets mentioned so often, and that is in the method of approach to truth. Religion largely relies on authority. It may be the authority of sacred texts, as in Sunni Islam and Protestant Christianity, or texts together with religious leaders who are divinely uh, inspired to interpret them, like Shiite Islam and Roman Catholicism. Uh, we don't have anything like that in the world of science. I, and I want to make a clear distinction. We do have heroes, as scientists we have enormous respect for, but they're not authorities to whom we go for solution of scientific problems. For example, in my field, certainly Einstein is the greatest hero of the 20th century, but no one today arguing about the theory of gravitation would settle the issue by referring back to Einstein's papers of 1915, 1916. Uh, today, it's understood that any reasonably good graduate student understands general relativity better than Einstein did. We have learned, we have progressed, and we, so in science we don't have prophets. We have heroes, but not prophets. It makes the argument a little more simple. We are quite willing to say there are many things we don't know. What right. Haldane, I think it was, said, you know, the universe is not just queerer than we understand, it's queerer than we can understand. Um, we, look for, we know there'll be great new discoveries. We, we know we'll live to see great things, but we know there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Mm. That's the whole distinction. The, the, the believer has to say not just that there is a God, the, the deist position, that there may be a mind at work in the universe. Mm -hmm a proposition we can't disprove, but the, they know that mind exactly, and can interpret it. They're on good terms with it. They've yes, have, they get yes. occasional revelations they from it. They have a book that is they get verbatim. Briefings from screen, it. Get, yes. Now, th this, you, any well, decent yeah. argument, any decent intellect has to begin by excluding people who claim to know more than they can possibly know. Yeah. You start yeah. off by saying, yeah. well, that's wrong to begin with. Now can we get on with it? Yeah. So theism's gone in the first round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's off the island. Exactly. It's out of the show. Mm -hmm.